1734, Nuremberg in Germany. Hundreds of thousands of Nazis gather for their party's annual rally, perfectly choreographed. Every element is carefully designed to seduce the senses. You had posters, you had banners, you had music, you had a ceremonial entrance, stormtroopers and flags. You had lively speeches. Hitler, Stig, It was a show as well as a political meeting. One thing which they have, which other parties don't have, is Adolf Hitler, who is a unifying and integrating figure within the party. And a master of propaganda. He was remarkably good at creating vibrant posters, vivid slogans. Hitler even claims to have designed the Nazi swastika flag. I myself had laid down a final form, a flag with a red background, a white disc, and a black swastika in the middle. The Nazis have never looked more impressive. Their appeal has never been more dangerous. Violence is always at the center of Nazism from start to finish. Behind the glamour lies a violent, racist, apocalyptic ideology. Violence was the means by which they sought to intimidate their opponents and eventually secure their power. But they project a very different image. The Nazis promote exciting new technologies, offer industrial reconstruction, jobs for all, and an artistic renaissance. They promise order and discipline. The great art is to put everyone in a uniform. This is what the Nazis, I suppose, really understood, male vanity. But Hitler only has one firm plan for his people to lead them into a world war. The Nazis intend to send millions of people to their deaths. Hitler and the Nazis are using their mastery of design and technology to seize total power for themselves before plunging the whole world into its greatest ever tragedy. Germany in the early 1920s. The First World War is barely over. Now, revolution is in the air. Shaken by the country's catastrophic defeat, communists and nationalists fight each other in the streets. The people are desperate for radical solutions to their terrible problems. If you think of what people in Germany had been through, they'd been through the First World War, when there's mass starvation, over half a million Germans die because of the Allied blockade uh, of malnutrition in the First World War. There's the terrible carnage on the front where huge numbers of German men are killed. In Munich, the spiritual home of German nationalism, many former soldiers are drawn to a new, growing political force. It is the Nazi party with its charismatic leader, Adolf Hitler. A veteran of the trenches himself, he's winning the city over to his new, darker, more violent brand of politics. But his ambition stretches far beyond Munich's streets to every part of Germany and beyond. In October 1922, he's ready to strike outside the city. Hitler has heard of a cultural event in the small town of Coburg, north of Munich. Socialists and communists will be taking part, so Hitler has decided to crash this party with hundreds of his paramilitaries, the stormtroopers. He's taken the bold step of hiring a special train. He orders his men to gather here at Munich's railway station. The order came. 
the whole lot of the storm troops was to turn out. We were about 600 strong. It was a Saturday in the middle of October. We were to assemble early at the central station and bring along rations for two days. The band was to march at the front. Hitler turned up well beforehand, and we found a special train awaiting us. The music rang out gaily in the early morning air, and the people had hung out flags to make a sort of festival of the occasion. We stopped once or twice during the journey to pick up a few more of our comrades from the more outlying places, and arrived at last 800 strong. Coburg is a kind of dinky little town with a nice castle on a rock in northern Bavaria. It was a small town. It was very closely allied to the former princely family, so very conservative. Not really an industrial town at all. So the working class, which is the supporters of the communists and the social democrats, the most determined opponents of Nazism, they were very small. There were very few of them. And so it was uh, an ideal stamping ground for the Nazis. They disembark here at Coburg's now run-down railway station. City officials beg Hitler not to march his troops through these streets. They're afraid of conflict with local communists. But Hitler angrily defies them. Conflict is what he wants. The march of the stormtroopers soon becomes a riot. Sure enough, we soon encountered storms of abuse from the crowds en route. Hitler led, and we followed. Stones, however, began to fly around. Then things got hotter. The Reds set upon us with iron rods and cudgels. That was going a bit too far. Hitler swung round, flourished his walking stick. That was the signal. And we flung ourselves upon our assailants. We counterattacked for all we knew. It was jolly hard work, I can tell you. They rained tiles on us from the roofs and windows and tore up the cobblestones for missiles. But with such slight opposition, it doesn't take very long for the Nazi stormtroopers to demoralize and then scatter their enemies. Once the violence has died down, they spend the night here at the local shooting club. The next day, they go sightseeing at Coburg Castle before returning home to Munich. This bloody riot is portrayed in Nazi mythology as a tremendous victory over the hated communists. Ten years later, a special badge is awarded to those who were with Hitler in Coburg. It becomes the Nazi party's most prestigious award. <laughs> Hitler's credibility as a street fighter and die-hard anti-communist is now established. One thing which they have, which other parties don't have, is Adolf Hitler, who is a magnet for support and also acts, and this is really quite important, he acts as a unifying and integrating figure within the party. And he's one of the main reasons why, unlike many of the competitors, the party doesn't fall apart. Nobody ever revolts or rebels against Hitler, and he has a sense of authority and an integrating power which keeps this thing together. Hitler is crucial for boosting the Nazis' popularity. His name appears again and again in their publicity. No other nationalist leader can draw such large crowds. When the movement began, it was tiny, insignificant, limited to Munich. And they had no resources, no money. The one thing they could do was hold political meetings to make propaganda. And Hitler realized that that was something that he was extraordinarily gifted at. He could hold an audience. And he could hold an audience week after week after week after week. He captivates people with his simple racist message. Germany has been betrayed, the Jews are to blame. Only Hitler and the Nazis can make Germany great again. As well as his speeches, Hitler also takes charge of Nazi propaganda in 1920. The impact is immediate. If you had to summarize the basic principles of Nazi propaganda, there would be simplicity, 
repetition and emotional appeal. Propaganda had to be absolutely simple so that the message could be understood by everyone. And it had to appeal to the gut, to emotion. He was remarkably good at creating strong rhetorical, vivid, dynamic posters and huge, vibrant slogans, teaser questions, getting these all over the place. And people begin to notice them. And what happens is because the posters are so damn good, people start turning up to the meetings out of curiosity. But in 1920, Hitler doesn't just have to compete with other nationalist parties. He also has to overcome the most powerful political force of the 20th century, the Communist Party. With its red banners, powerful symbols, strong organization, clear message and support from Soviet Russia, it seems poised to take over Germany and perhaps the world. Millions of Germans support the Communists and thousands attend their rallies as Hitler sees for himself. In Berlin after the war, I was present at a mass demonstration of Marxists in front of the Royal Palace and in the Lustgarten. A sea of red flags, red armbands, red flowers was in itself sufficient to give that huge assembly of about 120,000 people an outward appearance of strength. I was now able to feel and understand how easily the man in the street succumbs to the hypnotic magic of such a grandiose piece of theatre. Hitler wants a Nazi symbol and a Nazi flag at least as bold and popular as the Communists. He had an intuitive grasp of the importance of brandy. Hitler spends hours in Munich Public Library looking for inspiration, looking for the signs and symbols the party's going to use, the Nordic runes, the stylization. The stylization is his, and the colors are his. The red, black, and white are really highly symbolic. And this is something of which Germans were very, very aware. The flag of the empire was black, white, red. And the swastika flag is black, white, red. So this is simultaneously looking forward to a new modern dynamic movement, but also looking back and saying that we are the heirs to a German national tradition. As for who actually designed the swastika flag, Hitler couldn't have been clearer. Every detail was down to him. I myself, meanwhile, after innumerable attempts, had laid down a final form, a flag with a red background, a white disc, and a black swastika in the middle. And this remained final. But like so many of Hitler's claims, this is at best a gross simplification, if not an outright lie. The real creator of the flag is another Nazi, Dr. Friedrich Krohn, a dentist from Sternberg in northern Germany. Hitler dismisses his contribution as a good design very similar to mine. It will not be the last time he takes credit for someone else's work. Hitler was a plagiarist in everything. He didn't originate at all. He stole. He stole the symbols. He stole the rhetoric. He stole everything. But it was restylized. He was a great reimaginer, reconceptualizer. He was also a synthesizer. So you have a cacophony of different symbols, different rhetorics, different ideologies. And he produces this harmony from all this discord. He gives it a narrative structure. He integrates it. He makes it a highly coherent and cohesive symbol system. And he has a great natural talent to do this. From its creation in 1920, the Nazi swastika flag becomes an increasingly common sight carried by the stormtroopers as they attack their left-wing enemies. But despite their violence, many Germans support the stormtroopers. There's certainly amongst large proportions of the German population a fear of Bolshevism and of Russische Zustände, Russian conditions, chaos, um, and the fear that if 
we don't suppress the left and particularly the communists, this sort of thing could happen here. And we have to militantly prevent this sort of thing from happening. Enemies of the stormtroopers call them ill-disciplined thugs, but their smart brown uniforms are key to making them look respectable and popular. But who makes these uniforms? Metzingen, a small town in southern Germany. It has a long association with the fashion business, right up to today. It's also long been the home of the Hugo Boss Company and the location of its worldwide headquarters. The Boss family's first shop was here on Hindenburg Street. Hugo Ferdinand Boss takes over his parents' shop just after the First World War, but he has bigger plans. He decides to start making clothes, opening his factory in 1924 with just 10 sewing machines. The workers make everything from underwear to traditional loden coats. But one of the company's first big commissions is for a large batch of colored shirts for a distributor in Munich, including brown shirts for the Nazi party and stormtroopers. Hugo Boss may not have known who the shirts were for at this time, but in later adverts, he describes his company as a supplier of party equipment since 1924. The Hugo Boss factory is just one of many small and medium-sized firms that make the huge number of uniforms needed by all the different Nazi organizations. All these companies profit from Nazi party and later Nazi government contracts. The great art is to put everyone in a uniform. I counted actually about 170 different uniforms in Nazi Germany, but that's the marvelous thing, whether you're a coal miner, or whether you're in the Hitler Youth, whatever you are, there's a uniform and a badge and a star and all the rest of it for you personally. And this is what the Nazis, I suppose, really understood, is male vanity, like no regime in history had ever done. But the actual design of these uniforms is the work of other people. One is Walter Heck, a badge designer. In 1929, he creates one of the most notorious symbols in history, the SS runes. Heck isn't well off, so he accepts just two and a half rice marks, about 25 US dollars today, to allow the SS to use his new sinister symbol. Another key Nazi designer is Karl Diebitsch. He joins the Nazi party in 1920 and creates many of its most significant items, including the SS Dagger. In 1932, Diebitsch and Heck work together to create their most important and most notorious product, the new all-black uniform for the SS. By this time, the Hugo Boss factory is supplying uniforms to several Nazi organizations, the Stormtroopers, the Hitler Youth, and the SS. All these uniforms, badges, and symbols help forge a common bond among party members. The unified look also projects the image of a disciplined and organized party. The Nazis are determined to maintain a single style and approach in everything they do. Remember that the Nazi party is a voluntary organization. Most of the people in it are amateurs. It doesn't pay them their wage. How do you get all those desirable images of high polish in an amateur organization? So they had a lot of training programs. They had a lot of manuals on how to do it. And they had very specific detailed instructions on how to present a stage, for example. Where do you put the wreath? Where do you put the podium? What about the pleated curtains, what you could do and what you couldn't? Their instructions are, are very precise. If you have singing, it must be proper singing. It can't be a kind of beery, sentimental festival of random songs.
Also, you have to have capping. The party leaders must cap the speech, even though they've heard it a thousand times before, etc. They must set the example. So they have this very tight disciplined control. <laughs> to get this sense of high polish, which is what the party really wants to convey as an index of its credibility and determination. This image of determination and discipline is particularly attractive to former army veterans, as well as younger men disappointed to have missed out on the war experience. Although Germany lost the First World War, the men who'd fought at the front came back as heroes, and they had a terrific reputation of having fought for Germany particularly amongst the sort of right-wing, ultra-patriotic parts of the population. And the younger generation, who'd just been a little bit too young to fight in the war, felt really inferior in comparison. And that, I think, fueled a lot of the violence which the younger members of the uh, stormtroopers movement were prepared to use. When Hitler seizes power in 1933, Nazi ministers sign up many stormtroopers as auxiliary policemen. With access to police records, now the stormtroopers know the names and addresses of their political enemies. They start to raid homes and workplaces, seizing anyone they want. Violence is always at the center of Nazism from start to finish. Violence was the means by which they sought to intimidate their opponents and eventually secure their power. So they're prepared to beat people up, knife them, kill them, even to torture uh, leading figures in the other parties. With the power of arrest, the stormtroopers become even more violent. They feel invulnerable. They're no longer content just to beat their enemies up. They start to take them prisoner in a network of unofficial jails. This building is the only secret stormtrooper prison that still exists. Within these cells, at least 500 people were held in 1933. This is where the Nazi concentration camp system begins. Over 200 jails like this are set up in Berlin alone. Every party was involved in violence in the run-up to the Nazi seizure of power, where the Nazis outdid all the others. In the elections of July 1932, no fewer than 400 people were actually killed in the campaign. It's a level of violence we'd find now absolutely impossible to accept. As auxiliary policemen, the stormtroopers now have the legal power to hold people in so-called protective custody as long as they want. So they can interrogate, abuse, and even torture their victims. This harsh treatment leads to many deaths. The Nazis couldn't care less. But when their own people are killed, they're hailed as martyrs, such as Horst Wessel. Horst Wessel was a young man from a very respectable background. His father was a Lutheran pastor, and he was attracted towards right-wing politics after the war in the 1920s. His family were very, very conservative, and he went once, one step further, became an organizer for the brown shirts and uh, got involved in violent altercations in the early 1930s. The Nazis claim Horst Wessel was a brave, selfless young man who left university to live in a poor neighborhood. They say he helped local workers battle against left-wing agitators, which is why he was cruelly murdered by communist thugs. The leader of the Nazi party in Berlin at the time is Joseph Goebbels. He's already developing the propaganda skills for which he later becomes notorious. 
Goebbels, the master propagandist, turned this into a huge campaign, beginning with his funeral, of a man who sacrificed himself for Germany against the evil Reds. Goebbels arranges for Vessel's coffin to be paraded through central Berlin. Inevitably, there are clashes between Nazis, communists, and the police. At the cemetery, Goebbels turns Vessel's funeral into a propaganda stunt. He gives an emotional speech at the graveside, praising Vessel's sacrifice, making him sound like a Christian martyr. So he was used, he was reimagined, he was turned into something he never was. Throughout the life of the Nazi party, he was the ultimate Nazi. He was a believer who'd been cruelly murdered by the communist bastards. Horst Wessel has passed on. His mortal remains have given up on struggle and conflict. Yet I can feel almost physically his spirit rise to live on with us. He believed it. He knew it. That is how he lived. That is how he died. A soldier of the German Revolution. Once he stood with his hand on his belt, proud and upright, with the smile of youth on his red lips, always ready to risk his life. That is how we will remember him. Vessel had written a marching song only a few months earlier. Following his death, the words seem eerily prophetic. It soon becomes the official Nazi party anthem. So Horst Wessel was really a saint, Horst Wessel, <laughs> to the Nazis. There was nothing sordid about him. But the truth of Wessel's life and death is rather different from the Nazi propaganda version. What had actually happened is that he'd started living with a former prostitute. And it seems at least the communists put this about, that his death was due to a personal dispute with her former pimp. The most likely story is only slightly less sordid. Vessel and his girlfriend get into a dispute with their landlady over unpaid rent. The landlady goes to the local communists for help. She wants them to use force to get the couple to pay up. At first, they aren't keen to get involved in such a petty squabble. But when they learn the debtor is Horst Vessel, a well-known and hated stormtrooper leader, they agree. But instead of beating him up, they shoot him in the head. He later dies from his wounds. Germany would have totally forgotten this violent yet insignificant man if Goebbels hadn't turned him into the perfect martyr. Martyrdom is so important to the Nazis, they even publish a book listing 140 fallen members. And a guide to rituals, explaining how to conduct a Nazi funeral and showing the most tasteful Nazi gravestones. When one of the most senior party leaders, Fritz Todd, dies in a plane crash, he's rewarded with an elaborate state funeral. Fahnen der Wehrmacht und der Formationen und Gliederungen der Partei. Hitler himself leads the mourners. And comforts the family. The ceremony reveals how the Nazis are creating their own cult of death. It is rich in sinister symbolism 
including frequent use of a Nazi salute. Der Führer nimmt Abschied von einem seiner treuesten Kameraden und Mitarbeiter. The Nazi salute is one of the party's most recognizable features. Members think it's a traditional Aryan gesture, a manly way for them to show their commitment. But once again, the salute isn't original. It's clearly copied from Mussolini and the Italian fascists, but some Nazis try to claim otherwise. Also von den Nationalsozialisten wird, uh, immer the Nazis insist again and again, as well as students of folklore and those who looked into the origins of the salute, that it was actually a genuinely Germanic salute. This in turn brought the Italian fascists onto the scene, who insisted that this imperial Roman reference was their own, a crucial reference to their origins, so to speak. So the German Nazis and the Italian fascists had a never-ending debate with regard to the origin of the salute. The Herkunft des Grußes in einen nicht endenden Streit geraten sind. What is original is combining the salute with the cry of Heil Hitler. This turns a greeting into a pledge of allegiance. Das Besondere an dem Gruß ist Dass in der ersten Begegnung, uh, unter Menschen the particular thing about the salute is that when people were first meeting, a clear association with Adolf Hitler was demanded and given. So, with the salute and its reply, you were immediately able to carry out something like a conformity check of your counterpart, and that's what turns this salute into an excellent means of monitoring regime fidelity or regime affiliation. That's where the ingenuity, so to speak, of the salute lies. And that's its logic. The Nazis want to sweep away all the traditional and familiar German greetings, replacing them with the Hitler greeting and the Nazi salute. Conformity is essential to the Nazi project. But first, they have to win power. And by now, they've built a formidable organization for political campaigning. It isn't simply about Hitler. We're also talking about thousands and tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of people who are working at local level, giving of their time, giving of their resources, they're doing it every night. I mean, these are people who are going out, organizing rallies, organizing marches and so forth, without Hitler being in sight. They developed a correspondence school for training public speakers, which claimed to have trained about 6,000 speakers by 1933. Now, this was significant because it allowed the Nazis to send speakers to every village and neighborhood in Germany. Towns that had never had a political speaker before suddenly got regular visits from Nazi speakers. Now, these speakers weren't of Goebbels or Hitler's quality, but they didn't have to be. They brought the Nazi message to areas that hadn't heard any political speakers before. And one also shouldn't forget that this was an important source of revenue for the party. This is a party which, in its earlier years, activities on the ground are very largely self-financed. That is, by dues, by people contributing small amounts to the party, and also paying not merely membership dues, but also fees to come to hear the speaker. And if a regional group could get Hitler to speak, they could make a lot of money. They also manufacture a lot of regime tat all those little badges and so forth for party rallies and everything else is actually where financing the Nazi party. How does it have so much money? Well, it's a retail organization. It's selling gaudy merchandise, bright shiny buttons, and all the rest of it as a way of keeping itself going and paying its officials. So there is a market dynamic to the Nazi party. <laughs> The meetings and rallies are major money-making opportunities. You had posters, you had banners, you had music, you had a ceremonial entrance of SD stormtroopers and flags. 
you had lively speeches. For the great masses of our people, sufficient food should be provided so they can work with all their strength. What the Nazis were very careful to do was to make all of their events entertaining. So you'd have, for example, a choir of the Hitler Youth, you'd have a brass band, then you'd show movies. The point is that it was a show as well as a political meeting. One academic had said, actually, a Nazi party rally in the early 1930s was one of the best ways you could have spent your time. And it conveyed this idea of excitement that we're on the brink of an epic era. They're awfully good at doing that. Relentless campaigning leads to electoral success in June 1929. The Nazi party wins political control of its first town, Coburg, where only seven years before Hitler had been brawling in the streets. It's an important lesson in how to win power. Hitler realized that you couldn't do it by violence alone. So you had to have a kind of twin track approach Violence and intimidation on the one hand, and the quasi-legal or pseudo-legal way to power on the other hand, which means getting votes, becoming the largest party, and then getting into power by means that at least looked legal, passing laws. Coburg is also the first town to elect a Nazi mayor. It proudly takes the name of first German national socialist city. By now, the Nazis are starting to gain support from almost all parts of German society. In the early 1930s, they become a catch-all party of protest, so that they are able to appeal to virtually every sector of the population, with the obvious exception of Jews, so that they might not do as well amongst working-class voters than the socialists or communists. But nonetheless, they attract a considerable amount of working class support. They might not be able to do as well as the Catholic Center Party in Catholic regions, and particularly rural Catholic regions. But nonetheless, they're able to attract a considerable amount of Catholic support. So that one sees that the Nazis are able to gain support really from across the political spectrum. We think of the Nazis sort of entering with a fixed ideology and a concrete program. It wasn't like that at all. There is uh, one quote from them which says, we don't want high bread prices, we don't want low bread prices, we don't want bread prices to stay the same, we want national socialist bread prices. And so it was this indeterminacy, this flexibility, this whole process of, if you like, inventing it on the hoof, which explains their electoral success. By 1932, Hitler feels confident enough to make an audacious bid for power. He launches a nationwide election campaign to become president of Germany. To reach as many people as possible, he does something no German politician has ever done before. He takes to the air. Well, it was totally novel. Very few people had ever been by plane. Uh, Hitler recognized, though, the utility that he could hit many cities in a single day. It's not the huge rallies necessarily in Berlin or Hamburg or Munich or whatever, but in district towns where he attracts 10, 15, 20,000 people. It made for the most dramatic arrival uh, possible. Hitler's aircraft, the Junkers 52 3M, is the very latest technology, only a year old. He uses it to deliver 46 speeches in less than a month. The idea of Hitler coming down through the clouds, attracting these tens of thousands of people, many times a day, moving from one area to the next, made a big impression, and he was the first person to do this. Everyone could have a direct experience of this rock star charisma. Anticipation could be built. Often the schedule fell behind. Hitler was an hour or two late in arriving. But that only built the tension. 
And when Hitler would finally arrive, there'd be an explosion of cheers and sieg piles and so forth. So it was a very interesting and effective method of building the Hitler myth. Nazi propaganda exploits the image of the daring Hitler, not afraid of this still quite risky technology. One has to remember that this is a young man, a relatively young man for a politician. He is the representative of that younger generation who comes up from the trenches and as such is making a big impression on the German population. Despite Hitler's dynamic and relentless campaigning, he doesn't win the presidency, losing to the incumbent Paul von Hindenburg. But in fierce parliamentary elections, the Nazis do become the largest political party in the Reichstag, opposed by a similar number of communists and social democrats. German politics is increasingly polarized and violent. Democracy itself is becoming discredited. There are rumors the army is preparing a coup. Reluctantly, President Hindenburg appoints Hitler as chancellor to create some kind of stability. Hitler grasps this opportunity to start the process of Nazi political domination. It's a mistake to think that Hitler's appointment on the 30th of January 1933 was the seizure of power. It's only the beginning. It's only then, and July 1933, that the Nazis then used mass violence combined with a series of laws and decrees that they pass uh, to seize complete power. By the summer of 1933, up to 200,000 opponents of the Nazis, again, mainly on the left, had been put into concentration camps. That's an essential part of the Nazi seizure of power. With their enemies crushed, nothing can now stop the Nazi takeover of Germany. Nazi designs and symbols rapidly become state designs and symbols. In March 1933, the swastika flag becomes a German national flag. In May, the Horst Wessel song becomes part of the national anthem. And in July, the Nazi salute and Hitler greeting become compulsory for public employees. But they are soon being used by everyone. It took just a few months, and all greetings then common in Germany, regional or in different dialects, disappeared in no time at all and were replaced, substituted by the Hitler salute. Most need little encouragement, but for those who refuse to use the Nazi salute, there are severe penalties. The first concentration camp was established in Dachau, and already in 1933 there are reports of people, vicars for example, who refused the salute, who were detained in the Dachau concentration camp for a few weeks or for even longer. The Nazis insist this is now the only acceptable German greeting. Die Nazi Partei hat uh, in The Nazi Party reminded people again and again in public everywhere. Beer glasses were sold with the German greeting on them with Heil Hitler. On advertising columns, there were large posters saying that in Germany you must greet with Heil Hitler. So there was tremendous public propaganda favoring the adoption of this salute. So these two things complemented each other. There was a real readiness within the people to use this salute, but that, of course, was also supported by massive propaganda. So it was extremely difficult to withdraw from the obligation to make the salute. If so, you were suspected straight away. And the suspicion was then briefly, well, it led to the risk of you being denounced to the authorities. With every passing day, the Nazis take over more and more of daily life. 
the Nazis then reshaped the whole of German society to be part of the Nazi machine. For example, uh, the trade unions were banned and abolished and their property seized and a labor front, a Nazi labor front was created to represent all the workers. Nazism claimed to be much more than a political party that was only interested in winning the next election. It claimed to be a world view that had an interest in every aspect of human life. They simply were interested in everything. They were interested in transforming German views of art, German education, German media. If you had a football club, it had to become part of the Nazi Football Association. So and very often, local towns and communities would have three or four different choirs, for example, a socialist choir, a liberal choir. A conservative choir. It was a very highly politicized society. These are all scrapped by the Nazis and turned into the Nazi choir, as it were. So in the end, there was nothing left except the church and the army. Now, the church and the army were the only two institutions that were not fully Nazified. As somebody once said, wherever two or three people met, Hitler was there in spirit as well. In August 1934, Hitler's final obstacle falls away. The 86-year-old president, Paul von Hindenburg, dies. Hitler announces that the presidency has died with him. From now on, he declares he is the head of state with a completely new title, leader of Germany, the Führer. Total power is now in his hands. Hoffnung kennt mit Vertragheit, Zuversicht mit Verzweiflung. Immer wieder aber wird die Nation empausgerissen vom Schutz ihres Daseins. In just 15 years, the Nazis have grown from a tiny eccentric fringe group to a huge political party totally dominating Germany. Its annual rally and congress in Nuremberg is now a major national event. The Nuremberg rallies were a theatrical performance of Hitler's vision of Germany. Hitler asks an up-and-coming young director to film it for him. Her name is Leni Riefenstahl. Hitler comes through the crowd. He is of the crowd. He is of the people and rises above them. And so the leader speaks to the serried and ordered ranks of the masses, a vision of Germany which is about order, which is about hierarchy, the Führer principle, the leadership principle, and about hardness. And so greet you then, as my alten Freunde, it's all the Essmen, big hell! And every detail feeds into that. So, for instance, Albert Speer talks about the building of the Nuremberg Arena, how it was made of granite and hard German oak. Riefenstahl is given extraordinary resources, 30 cameras and nine aerial photographers. She has a crew of more than 170 people, many dressed in stormtrooper uniforms so they can blend into the crowds. The result is one of the most infamous propaganda films of all time, Triumph of the Will. It's a display of power to others. It's a way of saying we are big and we are strong and making people begin to believe that perhaps, you know, they are popular. Perhaps they're not very left field, in a sense creating a norm of acceptability. And the rhetoric of your vision of society was made real within these acts of theater and people participated in them and it made them believe in the reality of the society that could thereby be constructed. Die Partei wird für alle Zukunft die politische Führungsauslese des deutschen Volkes sein. Sie wird in ihrer Lehre unveränderlich, in ihrer Organisation stahlhart, in ihrer Taktik schmiegsam und anpassungsfähig, in ihrem Gesamtbild aber wie ein Orden sein. Goebbels was once asked what was his greatest propaganda achievement, and he said it's Hitler. Uh, it's the Hitler myth. It's the notion of this person who is utterly selfless, 
who gives himself up for the people, who is of the people, who is for the people, who tirelessly sacrifices and achieves for the people. And that image is central to Nazism. Hitler was absolutely central to the Nazi movement. It's, it's hard to imagine Nazism without Hitler. It'd be like imagining Christianity without Christ. He was the ideologist of the party. He was at the beginning and throughout the chief propagandist of the movement. He was really the center point about which all of Nazism revolved. Without him, there was no Nazi movement. What you're getting is this creation of a sense of German identity and German community, which is defined and embodied in Hitler, which means that if you see yourself as German, then you are bound to Hitler and you are, in a sense, bound to follow Hitler. But where is Hitler leading Germany to? In 1934, Many Germans seem too dazzled by Nazi glamour to care. But Hitler has decided. He's already ordered the construction of thousands of new tanks and warplanes. They are essential for the next stage of his project. A great war of conquest. A war that would be the most destructive in history. 